to see where they came in from. Yeah. So we're now broadcasting, so that's uh, okay. Cool. Right. Talk to you later. Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Nigel Hedges. I'm here together with Rob Jewell, my colleague from Fluke Networks, uh, to talk to you about new developments in our OTDR environment, um, specifically the high dynamic range OTDR, which is intended for targeted single mode applications, which we'll come to in a minute or two. Uh, I will um, switch off my ugly mug at the moment so that you, know, you don't have to watch that all the way through. And let's see where we get to. Now, you'll, I hope, accept my apologies. Some of these slides uh, are close relations to some that I showed a couple of weeks ago. Um, so um, hopefully I won't bore you to death. So um, OTDRs, optical time domain reflectometers, uh, the primary troubleshooting tool for fiber installations of all types, optical fiber, used in everything from telecoms to aerospace and automotive and pretty much everything in between. Um, loads of different fiber core sizes, loads of different connectors involved. Um, there are specific environments where, uh, particularly in the single mode environment, where uh, issues arise which, are, which require uh, particular sets of capability. So, Let's, uh, let's step forward swiftly and look at um, a simple uh, explanation of an optical time domain reflectometer. Um, sorry, just a sec. Um, an optical time to reflectometer, we try and simplify that and we say, uh, an OTDR uses pulsed modulated light at specific wavelengths, those are the same wavelengths at which data is transmitted, to measure fiber length and distance to event or whatever happens on the fiber, whatever impacts the performance of the fiber is measured in terms of distance away. Uh, OTDRs will also indicate power loss at each event and most modern OTDRs today will give you an overall loss end to end because that's what determines whether or not a signal transmitted from one end will arrive at the other. Most OTDRs will also indicate reflectance loss and you'll notice I used the word measure when we were talking about length and I used the word indicate about power loss and reflectance. And the reason for that is that OTDR does not have a true meter 
function. It doesn't have a calibrated output necessarily. And therefore, indications of power loss and indications of reflectance tend to be less accurate than if you had used uh, a light source and power meter to produce them. Typically, we expect to see um, somewhat less loss indicated with an OTDR than with light source and power meter. OTDRs are not all equal. Um, OTDRs are built for different jobs. Uh, some of them are for long range telecoms work and therefore they have huge power supplies, huge amounts of power that's, that's uh, fired into the, into the uh, fiber under test. They need to have the ability to transmit um, a pulse of light over several thousand kilometers. The net result is uh, that while they're very good at testing over several thousand kilometers, their typical resolution is then in terms of kilometers or hundreds of meters. Well, that's appropriate for telecoms, but it doesn't really work in an enterprise environment or a campus environment or, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the type of places where the fiber links are measured in terms of kilometers, not in thousands of kilometers. Um, some units are short range, high resolution units, and that's really how I would characterize ours. Uh, the Fluke Network's OTDR portfolio comprises essentially two uh, main units, uh, the standard OTDR, which we use in data centers and, and typical campus installations, and this new one, the uh, high dynamic range variant, which is specifically for single mode applications. Um, Another thing typically that is that we see is that modern OTDRs use sophisticated software to make it easier to understand what's going on. Um, a huge number of people will look at the, at the OTDR trace that you see on the right. They see the heartbeat pattern, they nod wisely, and they have very little idea what is going on uh, on that trace. So one of the things we have the ability to do is to convert that trace into um, a picture. Uh, we call it an event map. Uh, that's a marketing term, but essentially it is a diagram of what's happened from the OTDR down the length of the fiber with length measurements, with uh, indications of where the connectors exist, uh, where the fiber ends and those kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, and make it much easier to understand what is going on. And then all OTDRs have limitations. Um, all OTDRs have event and measurement dead zones, which vary depending on their design and their intended use. Um, an event dead zone is the distance behind one event or one happening uh, on the, along the fiber during which the OTDR is unable to detect another event. So you could call it a shadow uh, behind the event, um, and depending on the design of the OTDR, that can be a very short uh, distance or a very short period of time, or it can sometimes be quite a long. Um, a measurement dead zone uh, is different in that that is the distance behind the first event before the OTDR can measure the performance of the next event or an additional event. So event dead zones are how far before we can see a second event, measurement dead zone, how far before we can measure an additional event. Um, dynamic range is always a question and it used to be always the first question that, uh, that um, uh, operators would ask, how much is the dynamic range? Um, the argument being that the more dynamic range you have, the better off you are, uh, is not entirely true. Uh, dynamic range should be appropriate to the intended use. You do not have to have masses of dynamic range um, in a short, uh, let's say under 200 kilometers, in a short link, uh, which has relatively few bends connectors in it. Um, that's, it's just a, a waste and you end up with an awful lot of ghosting going on. So dynamic range needs to be appropriate. And OTDRs typically work best when launch and receive fibers are used. Um, that's because obviously the OTDR is operating at the speed of light um, and um, a pulse of light um, has a known uh, period. So it might be uh, you know, a, a microsecond for the sake of argument. 
that's quite a long pulse, um, a microsecond pulse um, has a length associated with it because of the speed of light. So when we, we turn the light on, microsecond later, we turn the light off. Where is the front edge of the light? Well, it's, uh, it's a significant distance away. Um, so launch and tail fibers make a huge difference to being able to see the performance of connections. We cannot measure the performance of a connector on its own. We can only measure the performance of a connection. That is true of all OTDRs. Um, that means that if you want to measure the, uh, the performance of the far end connector, you need to have a tail fiber plugged in or a receive fiber plugged in so that the light has somewhere to go and you can measure the performance of the complete connection. And possibly most importantly, um, all end faces need to be clean prior to testing. And uh, I apologize if this is something that you hear on a very regular basis, but we still see an awful lot of people uh, using OTDRs and getting questionable results. And the questions relate to the condition of the connectors that they are plugging into. So we need to, do, to bear that in mind. So, um, Having simplified the OTDR to, to that point, let me show you uh, our current range. All of these units, I'm sure you're aware, use the same mainframe. So this is uh, the, new, uh, the new module, uh, the high dynamic range module is a plug-in for the existing Versive platform. If you have a Versive model of any description, the uh, high dynamic range OTDR will plug into it. It is the only one with the pretty green cap um, that you see here. So this is the HDR OTDR. Um, but obviously we have units um, uh, for uh, other, env other environments as well. Um, the important thing here being that the HDR uh, high dynamic range unit only operates in single mode. So it only ever has one port on the top. Well, one port plus the visible light source um, and always operates at 13, 10 and 15, 15 nanometers. And then there are optional 1490 or 1625 nanometer outputs as well. Um, and you can opt to have just the two or either of the three, uh, 1490 or 1625 uh, outputs at the same time. So uh, why the HDR module? Um, well, attaches to the Versive mainframe, as I said. Um, we had originally intended it for datacom installers, outside plant contractors. Uh, more recently, we've also found a number of end users uh, who had specific requirements for testing of um, single mode fiber, um, particularly in the uh, rail, metropolitan rail area environment. Um, they require high dynamic range for links, including passive optical networking splitters, uh, which are particularly um, demanding when it comes to testing of, uh, of uh, last mile. Um, and uh, for uh, addressing data center applications, which require higher dynamic range, uh, like ultra low loss single mode fiber, where we are specifically seeking uh, information about uh, macro and micro bends, which may or could impact the performance of the fiber. Um, so we have applications to include um, utilities, campus, uh, access, perimeter security, um, identification location of macro bends, uh, which are the primary uh, culprits of uh, loss in single mode environments, um, fiber to the X, or fiber to the home, the building, the apartment, uh, et cetera. Um, and last but not least, enterprise uh, wide area networks, last miles, multi unit dwellings, and passive urban networking over local area networks, otherwise known as POL. All of these have requirements for additional dynamic range. Um, we build our additional dynamic range into the module, um, but we have not seen uh, fit to extend the units uh, maximum distance beyond the 130 kilometer range. So we are, we are still in the short range, high resolution environment here, and we are looking very much 
to the last mile and to data center applications with this particular module. Uh, I plan, uh, in fact, to show you uh, the module connected to uh, my mainframe uh, during the course of this presentation. Uh, so we'll move on from there. Um, obviously, as I started out saying before, um, before we do anything else, we, uh, we need to think in terms of inspection and cleaning of fibers. Uh, again, this is something that I'll show you, but I have to show you the classic uh, transfer of dirt. This is a nice clean fiber end face. Um, and this is one which I wiped on my shirt, uh, which isn't quite as clean. If I plug the clean end face and the dirty end face together, the fact that the two are physical contact connectors will result in this, which is an end face which is uh, contaminated. Um, but as you can see, the contam but due to the geometry of the end faces, the contamination is forced into this circular pattern uh, on the uh, fiber end face. Now, uh, typically what will happen with that is that over time, the contamination will migrate um, uh, across the end face and you will see a reduction in performance. We definitely don't want that and certainly um, neither of those two dirty end faces would approach passing the condition standard which we all know and love or not. So what's absolutely essential there is that we clean the launch fibers before every mating. Um, we uh, think about uh, making sure that everything is clean, not only our launch fibers, but also the fibers on the installation themselves need to be in excellent condition before we plug the OTDR in. There is no point in plugging the OTDR in to a dirty, po a, a, a dirty port. You will, uh, you will only get poor results. So OTDRs have a significant role in troubleshooting. And obviously, if you don't have an OTDR available, then the best you can do is to shine a bright light down the fiber, try to determine whether it comes out at the far end, but not at any of the connectors. Um, any kind of a glowing connector is a sign of an issue. Um, you can inspect and clean the end faces, and you can replace the link or re-terminate. The joy of this is, uh, it's a small investment, you're very limited in diagnostics, and you are, related, you are limited to trial and error when it comes to getting test results out. With an OTDR and clean end faces, obviously we can get really nice indications of where the issue is, uh, or where the issue appears to be, um, bearing in mind that we always want to test in both directions. So we're testing upstream and downstream, and we may find that um, an issue which appears to exist in one direction does not exist in the other. Um, that is usually a, an indication of a small change, or in some cases a significant change, in the index of reflection, refraction, 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 as we go from the launch fiber to the fiber under test. Um, in these images, what you're looking at is the OTDR at the bottom of the screen here. Then the launch fiber is always colored gray. The installation is always colored black. Good connectors are blue, bad connectors are red. And the tail fiber is once again colored gray. So we have a really good indication of um, where the issue exists uh, in one direction and possibly not in the other. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on from troubleshooting and look at certification or testing for performance. Um, and certainly in the data environment, and I have to split the, the story here between um, testing in a passive optical network environment and testing in a data center or enterprise environment. Uh, passive optical network environment, typically we are testing a single fiber. Um, in a data center environment, typically the fibers are deployed in pairs. So we tend to test them in pairs because one is transmit and one is receive. For certification of those fibers, um, we have two test regimes. One is called the basic test regime. The other is called the extended test regime. And irrespective of whether we're uh, a US uh, allied company, in which case we look at TIA 568 as our uh, reference standard, or an ISO organization, in which case we look at ISO 14763-3, uh, 
Um, there are two test regimes and the basic test regime is the light source and power meter, which we see over here, which we see here. Um, and that is excellent at measuring loss and is the most accurate measurement of loss. Um, but gives us absolutely no indication about where in the fiber the loss exists. Um, the OTDR is the one which is mm. responsible for telling us where the loss happens. And uh, we are, uh, in, in, in terms of both standards, we are required always to do the light source and power meter, and we can opt to add the OTDR test result. Um, in standards terms, it is not possible or it's not allowed to use the OTDR alone to certify fiber. And certainly none of the manufacturers who offer warranties on their fiber solutions, as far as I'm aware, none of the manufacturers will accept OTDR test results for warranty purposes. Light source and power meter is required for warranty. Um, but if your client wants to know where in the installation he should go to um, improve the loss of the installed fiber, then the OTDR is the one which will indicate where the loss is. And obviously we'll also identify bottlenecks. Um, now we make this easy uh, in a data center environment by testing with a smart loop. Uh, that, the smart loop concept means that we test a transmit and receive pair at the same time by using um, a smart loop at the far end. The great joy of this is that it forces uh, the operator um, to perform uh, the OTDR tests correctly, by which I mean it requires him to test both fibers in both directions at the same time and produce a bi-directional average. Um, it also means that by definition, uh, you must use a launch fiber, a smart loop fiber, and a tail fiber, um, and it avoids any adaptation with hybrid cords, um, and it ensures that we handle the launch and tail fibers correctly, which fundamentally means we leave them in place. At the same time, it also reduces testing time by something over 50%, um, and with a bit of luck, uh, the poor old technician is not on his own, Although if he is, then two or three smart loops mean he can test multiple pairs before he has to run down to the far end to move the loops around. And the smart loop uh, looks like this, um, and I'll show you this later on. Um, so the first phase of testing is that we test down what is determined as fiber A here. So let's call it the transmit fiber. Uh, through the launch fiber into fiber A, to the far end where there is a smart loop, which is another launch fiber, which directs the fiber, the light back down fiber B, which is the RX fiber from the near end uh, to the tail fiber. And we get one measurement in that direction. Then we disconnect from that launch fiber. We connect to the, what was the tail fiber and we test the other way around. So through the RX, fiber through the spare launch fiber into the TX fiber and back into what is now the tail. And the net result is that we get uh, two fibers tested in two directions um, in a relatively short space of time. And automatically we're able to calculate, or the OTDR is able to calculate the bi-directional average, which is the valid test result for each of these two fibers. So you get two test results, very swiftly. So bi-directional averaging is very much enables us to look at this and, and yes, we have one connection which appears to have an issue associated with it when we test it in this direction. Then we test it in the other direction um, and we find that that is now no longer an issue, but this has, uh, this connection has developed uh, or is developing uh, an issue due to directional issues. And when we average the two together, we find that what was a fail becomes a nice clean pass. So directional issues related to index of refraction are dealt with by the bi-directional average. And the bi-directional average is in 
data center environments is truly the only standards based recognizable acceptable test result um, every now and then we do come across uh, uh, customers who suggest that they would like to have uh, a, an OTDR test in one direction um, and frankly uh, there is very little value in an OTDR test in one direction particularly if it isn't a clean pass so uh, this is obviously data center this applies to single mode in the data center just as it does in uh, to multi-mode uh, so bi-directional averaging uh, is something that we do testing with a smart loop is something that we do it reduces the length of time we spend testing um, and uh, and and gives us valid test results almost without question right so there we go so uh, at this point i'm going to switch over and uh, show you the live screen from my optifiber pro which is fitted with the green hdr hdr otdr module um, we will have uh, a quick look at end face inspection because one of the things which is true of uh, the vast majority of um, hdr otdr environments is that and particularly where splitters are concerned is that it uses apc angled polished connectors and they are a little different when it comes to inspection um, and then we'll look at launch and receive fibers we'll look at the splitter environment um, we'll look at uh, fault location and identification um, and then we'll look at uh, load loss uh, single mode testing with a smart loop um, and hopefully i can do all of that in a relatively short space of time let me just do that and so I will bring across and we'll bring across this. So this is the display from my uh, from my versive mainframe. Uh, I have it currently set in fiber inspector mode and what you're looking at at the moment is an APC connector and it looks a little shadowy because APC connectors are directionally sensitive so we need to rotate the APC connector until we get the clearest possible picture we can and then adjust the focus and as you can see this APC connector is not perfect. However, if I hold the camera still and rotate the APC connector, mm -hmm. you'll see that it tends to disappear. And this is down to the fact that we need to get the angle right in order to be able to view the image properly. So that needs cleaning. I'm definitely not happy with that. Um, so I'll give that a swipe for the cleaner so that we can use it later on there yeah, that's much better much prettier i've got another one to play with here as well so i'll do that one as well there is a slot in the uh, camera adapter for APC and it has an angle on it so you can't use it for anything else um, which helps to get the alignment correct there we go just make sure okay that one seems to have a mark on it not tiresome Okay, so that is a mark which is not the cleaning off. That is not a good thing. Put the couch back on that just gently so that we don't 
lose anything. That'll be ready for later. Right, uh, so uh, first thing we're going to do is we are going to uh, go home. And here I have my project, it's all set up. Um, and once again, uh, we have uh, the auto mode. Now, um, sophisticated OTDRs these days have an auto mode which adjusts mm -hmm. everything to suit the installation under test. Um, old fashioned OTDRs, uh, previous model OTDRs, the auto mode was really only good for determining how long the fiber was. Um, but these days, uh, with, uh, with significant amounts of development in software and artificial intelligence, um, the OTDR is much more able to um, determine uh, what is happening down the length of the fiber using multiple different pulse widths, using multiple different um, uh, uh, filters. Um, we can get an awful lot better picture of what's happening on here. So the only thing that I need to do is I need to check my launch fiber compensation before I start. So I go here, I go to set launch compensation. And down at the bottom here, you can see that the current settings are 158.8 meters for the launch, 157.2 for the tail. And that was set uh, this morning at a quarter past nine. So I'm going to leave those as they are uh, rather than resetting them. And I'm going to go home again and I'm going to press the test button. Now, one thing which is certainly true uh, about uh, testing in a passive optical network environment is that we have um, an item. You'll notice that my port connection quality is excellent. That means that the connector between the OTDR and the launch fiber is really, really good and clean. Um, and here we're starting to see the beginnings of a trace appearing on the screen. Um, different wavelengths happening at the moment. Uh, this OTDR is running three different wavelengths. Uh, the default wavelengths being 1310, 1550 and 1625. Um, and losses should be greatest on the 1310, um, the 1550 and 1625 wavelengths should pretty much mirror exactly what's going on. So here we have our test result um, and you'll see that um, the um, OTDR has identified a uh, loss at 1244 meters uh, from the start of the installation. So we start measuring uh, length at this point, that's where zero meters is. Um, and the loss event is at 1244 meters and it is a loss. Uh, you'll notice the, the black triangle in the corner of the red box. Um, that enables us to identify that loss as either a loss or an APC connector. If we know there's an APC connector there, we can identify it as such on the test result. Um, it won't change the pass to a uh, the fail to a pass, but it would help to identify uh, the uh, connector if we knew it was there. So if I change it to APC connector, then as you can see, that event is now a connector. Um, it still has excessive loss associated with it, but it is there. Um, possibly, I'm going to change it back again. Uh, possibly more importantly, we've also identified the presence of a 16-way splitter. Um, this is an automatic detection, but here it is. So this is a one by 16 splitter. Now bearing in mind, um, we are identifying which end we're shooting from, uh, which is obviously the subscriber end. Uh, you can only really shoot an uh, a, a splitter in one direction uh, because the loss going from the single end of the splitter to the multiple end uh, is um, horrendous and it also pre presents the OTDR with, in this case, 16 different uh, ports to follow. So um, you only ever shoot splitters from what is called the subscriber end. Um, in this case, uh, this is a 16-way splitter um, and we have it identified, we have its distance away identified and we can see pretty much everything else going on. We also have a poor connection at the far end 
uh, just before the tail. Once again, the loss at that far end connector is higher than we would like it to be. Um, uh, so we, we have the ability um, without pretty much setting the OTDR up at all um, to uh, produce a test result which is entirely valid, which shows everything that is happening down the length of this fiber, um, indicates where the splitter is, which is possibly the most important uh, piece of data as far as uh, most installers are concerned. Um, and it gives us a very nice picture. We also have the trace um, and bear in mind in this case, because we can only shoot the splitter upstream and the trace will only be valid in one direction. You can see um, the start and end uh, of the uh, fiber. Start is indicated by the dotted line, the end by the beacon, because that's where I left the beacon on the event map. Um, if we wanted to see where this loss is uh, on the length of the fiber, I can change it so that the beacon now appears on the trace at the, uh, at the loss point. Um, that waterfall display uh, to the left of it is obviously the splitter. That's the massive um, loss generated by the splitter. But as you can see, uh, the three different wavelength traces all follow one another really nice and closely. So that tells us that we are getting a true representation of this fiber installation. Um, and those of you who are wondering how I happen to have uh, two and a half kilometers of fiber uh, in my uh, study, um, I'm just lucky. Uh, and we have a demo box that has that much fiber in it. Um, now, this is great. Uh, obviously, fully automated means we don't have necessarily a huge requirement for training. Um, we can um, adjust setups if we want to, but equally, um, I'm going to exit from that. And I'm going to say that's auto uh, passive optical networking, but we can also have a manual passive optical networking setup, which is here. And manual passive optical networking works in a slightly different environment, uh, or in a slightly different way, because we can set up all sorts of settings that otherwise would be automatic. So we can do things like uh, identify splitters. Um, so we can identify what type of splitter we might have. Um, we might say, uh, okay, um, what is there here? And uh, we can actually go discover. We won't want to save that little test result, but we can go and discover splitters that we know exist. And the OTDR has enough inbuilt intelligence to be able to come back to us and say, I see a splitter, and this splitter has all of the characteristics of takes a little while, but you obviously only need to do it once for each type of splitter. Um, splitters have relatively specific characteristics. So when you get, uh, when the OTDR identifies the, the presence of a splitter, it can usually also identify what type of splitter it was. Oh, I should have asked it to look for one by 16. I forgot, my apologies. So we can set up for splitters. My apologies, I forgot to do that. Um, we can select the range that we're going to look at. So in this case, I have four kilometers of fiber less than. I can set the, pub, the pulse widths. Um, so for instance, I can choose, in this case, uh, to select a specific pulse width or not. Um, I can choose the averaging time and choose 10 seconds because we've got three things. Uh, end thresholds, loss thresholds. You know, we can set the loss threshold at uh, 0 0.5 dBs. Um, 
and we can set up the macro bends. So macro bends are detected by the difference in loss between two different wavelengths. So we can set up the macro bend thresholds here if we want to. Uh, I'll leave them as they are. Um, and then I can hit done and uh, I can run a test using the manual testing just like that. The only thing that doesn't happen with manual passive optical networking mm. is we don't necessarily get automatic detection of the splitter or identification of the splitter. So this will take 35 seconds during which I will, I won't sing you a song because I'm a terrible singer. Um, but with a bit of luck, I will be able to produce a test result at the end of it, which will be fascinating. Um, yeah, um, passive optical networking, uh, really a different environment for most of us. Um, not enormously scary as long as we recognize that the splitters themselves have very typical performance behaviors. Um, let me go back to the event map because we will still have stuff on the event map. So here is the event map. We identified, uh, in this case, a 16-way uh, splitter. Um, and here we need to tell the OTDR that that is an APC connector. It's still a bad APC connector because it's the same one that we had under auto. Um, but in this case, uh, the OTDR recognizes it as an event, but we need to tell it that it is the, uh, the connector at the far end. Um, also notice that um, launch compensation is not used uh, by default in uh, manual OTDR mode. So you can see that the launch fibers are there, but they are no longer identified specifically as launch fibers. Um, I could switch that on and then they would be identified as launch fibers again. And the OTDR would look at that 158 meters at the far end and would recognize it as the far end uh, tail fiber and would then probably recognize that connector as being a connector rather than a, uh, rather than a loss event. So here we are producing um, test results which are valid in the splitter environment, given that in a splitter environment, we can only test uh, from the subscriber end. Uh, OTDRs are not able to test the other direction uh, in the vast majority of cases and will produce uh, extremely confusing results um, if your 16-way splitter is uh, terminated to 16 fibers. Uh, your test result looks horrendous from the far end. So you only get valid um, OTDR results uh, in a splitter environment when you are going upstream. Um, let me show you uh, a slightly different thing now. Um, so I need to uh, go home. I'm not saving any of this data. I'm going to go back to the auto passive optical network OTDR. Um, and I'm going to use selected. And I'm going to show you a different fiber. This one is Kind of nice. Doesn't have a splitter in it, but it does demonstrate a uh, a particular function. Um, let's see how this one goes. So here we have no splitter, and what you'll see with a bit of luck uh, is that. Because there is no splitter detected, uh, the um, test time is significantly reduced. That's because when the OTDR detects a splitter, it then has to test the splitter with multiple different pulse widths and wavelengths in order to confirm that it is uh, the, the type of splitter it thinks it is. If it's going to report it as a 16-way splitter, it needs to be certain that it meets those criteria. In this particular case, this is a different type of in, uh, a different type of issue. We have a bend detected naught meters from the far end of the fiber. So we now have our 
launch and tail fibers back. First connector, which is this one here, is uh, at the launch point, has a small associated loss. It has no, there is no problem associated with it. In the middle of the fiber, there is a 1 dB loss of 250.75 meters. And we could say that's an APC connector, but it isn't. It's a loss. But most importantly, we have this bend. And the bend is at the far end of the installation, essentially at the far end connector. And this is what happens in single mode environments uh, when um, the installation is forced into a particular uh, configuration. And the net result is that you get a very tight bend immediately behind the connector. And that very tight bend contributes significantly to loss. Um, so we have a bend detector built into the unit. Um, it looks for, as we saw before, those differences in loss across the trace. And here you can see those differences in loss across the trace. Uh, this one here will be 1310, 1550, 1625. I have three different traces running. And that is what determines the, that the unit has identified a significant bend. Um, a, I suppose we could call it a debilitating bend in the fiber installed here. So we have the ability to uh, identify splitters to position them correctly along the length of the fiber as long as we're testing upstream. We also have the ability to look down the fiber and to determine whether there are debilitating bends or performance reducing bends in the fiber and also where they are. In this particular case, it's right at the end um, of the installation, which is where we often see them in high performance uh, single mode installations, they tend to be uh, sensitive to how they are plugged in at the patch panel end. So uh, the last thing that I wanted to show you this morning was um, the smart loop test because um, that's useful in single mode environment. So I'm going to go home uh, with the tester. I'm, I'm at home, but I'm going to press the home button and I'm going to change the test setup to smart loop OTDR, which is here and use selected. And this is bi-directional. I've selected only two wavelengths, 1310 and 1550 for this. Um, we are going to be testing two fibers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to be testing two fibers, one upstream and one downstream, and then we're going to reverse the cords. Um, and I need to check that I have valid launch compensation. So here we have smart loop is set up. I have launch and tail. Should have smart loop as well. I think possibly I've got to do that again. One and then two. So I'm connecting my three launch fibers together. One launch, one tail, one smart loop. And I press the set button. And I don't want to save that test result today. And I still have a good clean port, which is nice to know. And so there we have three launch fibers, one of them from the OTDR port to the launch point, 160 meters, another one to the tail, which is 155.89, and then another one to the end of the fiber, which is 314.01, and we hit save. And we say OK. And we go home. And now we're ready to connect to the link under test and actually test the pair of fibers. So I'm collecting my launch fiber to one end of the installation. 
I'm connecting my smart loop to the far end. In there. You'll be pleased to know that I did it clean and inspect all of these fibers this morning because you know I'm very happy about that. And the tail fiber goes in at the near end again. There we go. Make sure they're all plugged in all the way because that always helps. Press the big yellow test button. And again, with a bit of luck, because we're not in a splitter environment, we should get nice short test time. And then we will receive an instruction to reverse the test calls, or rather to disconnect the launch fiber, which now becomes the tail, and connect the tail fiber to the top of the OTDR, which now becomes the launch. You'll notice that there is a, in the picture, there is a small sacrificial cord in there. That is the port saver. Uh, that is there to protect the port so that we're not constantly plugging and un unplugging potentially dirty cords directly into the optics of the OTDR. So I've reversed the cords, I can hit done, and the unit will go away. And in another 13 seconds or so, with a bit of luck, yeah, 13 seconds uh, will provide us with a second test result for these two fibers. So, nothing ever, some things don't always work according to plan. In this case, um, the uh, return fiber test was not able to detect the presence uh, or both ends of the uh, loopback fiber, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. net result is that we get a slightly different result. So, what we have at the moment here is we have um, fiber A end one. Uh, Okay, fiber A end two, but we don't get a bi-directional average, which is extremely irritating because it was working beautifully this morning. Um, now at this point, uh, if we were in the field, we would clean the end faces of the uh, smart loop fiber, which is something that I can do, and we would try again. However, that would require an additional 40 seconds or so, and I don't think um, we're going to add an awful lot from this. Uh, please uh, just accept that bidirectional average is the valid test result. Um, and the net result here is that um, we have a fail in our test result, um, primarily because uh, we couldn't see the connectors of the loopback fiber. So um, I'm going to now uh, close that down and go back to my PowerPoint slides um, because there are a couple of uh, things that are worth talking about. Um, after OTDR testing, it is always worth um, using the camera to get end face images um, because they form part of your test report. They are part of your defense in the event of um, in the event of the fiber not working after six months or so. And that is usually or sometimes down to um, the work practices of the client. Uh, they do not always clean the end faces before they plug stuff in. And the net result is that you end up with end faces which are either dirty or damaged or both. Um, but if you have end face images from when you left site, so at the end of testing, if you have end face images when you left site, then you have decent defense that it is not your fault that the fiber isn't working. 
if you are particularly uh, specific, then you would use uh, the industry standard, uh, which is IEC 61300-3-35 edition two at the moment, um, which specifies how much dirt you can have in each zone of the fiber end face, um, how much dirt, how much zone, how much uh, damage, um, and uh, we'll give you uh, a really good indication of whether or not the fiber can be expected to perform. Um, then obviously we upload our test results uh, in most instances. Um, these days a lot of people are using our Linkware Live cloud service, which works beautifully. And the latest version of the Versif mainframe has inbuilt Wi-Fi, so you don't even need a Wi-Fi dongle anymore. Um, if you don't have Wi-Fi available, then uh, there is an RJ45 port on the bottom left corner of the tester, which would enable you to plug it into a wired network. As long as the wired network has access to the internet and you can authenticate the unit on the wired network, your test results will be in the cloud um, in about uh, 30 seconds. Um, and obviously from there, we can produce the test reports that we know and love. Um, that one's a copper one, this is a fiber one. Uh, this is a very uh, comprehensive uh, fiber test report. So it has light source and power meter test, re test results. It has OTDR test results with the bi-directional average um, and also the directional tests, N1 and N2. This is for a single fiber. Um, and the event map is all included in the test report. Uh, more importantly, perhaps also included are the end face images. Now, the end face images are time stamped, so they should indicate that the end face images are those taken as you leave site, not as you arrive on site. Um, so, the client should be able to very clearly understand that when you finished the testing and covered the installation up, the end faces were clean and undamaged. That's the important thing. Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thank you for your attention. Um, I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say at the beginning of the uh, thing, if you have questions, you can bang them on the question bar. Um, Rob is monitoring the questions and is also monitoring the chat, um, hopefully. Um, so if there are any questions, I'll do my best to give you clear answers. We're all clear at the moment, Nigel. Oh, excellent. 13 people with no questions. Either I was really good or everybody's gone to sleep. Either one of those is possible. Well, I can switch my video back on so that you can see how desperate I am to answer a question. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I'll do my best with whatever you ask. Um, otherwise, thank you all for attending. Um, Rob, thanks for, uh, for uh, looking after all the back office stuff while I was rabbiting away. Um, anything I need to add? If there are no questions, I will uh, shut this down and end the meeting. Is everybody happy with that? Thank you very much indeed. Take care, have a great day. Uh, look forward to talking to you all soon. All the best, bye-bye.